All right, welcome to the show today. It's nice to have you back. It's nice to have you back at the What's Labs channel. That's what this channel is called. Today we are talking about lockouts. We're talking about what lockouts are and when they've happened in the past. A lockout is when a sports league's owners and its players can't come to an agreement on how to run the business. Primarily, this comes down to splitting the money, splitting the revenue generated by the league. This agreement is called the Collective Bargaining Agreement. Maybe you've heard it referred to as a CBA. CBAs exist in all labor unions, but today, Today, we are talking about the CBA between the owners of the NBA and the NBPA, the National Basketball Players Association, which is what every NBA player is a member of. The current CBA, the current agreement, is set to expire in the 2023-2024 season at the very end of it. It's coming up. Even though the NBA is making more money than ever and most people don't suspect that there's going to be a lockout, I do, and I'm going to tell you why later. So usually the CBA runs out every six or seven years, the owners and the president of of the MBPA, which is right now it's CJ McCollum, it was Chris Paul, have to come together and come to a new agreement and a new expiration date on that agreement. Usually when this expires, both the players and the owners feel like they're getting screwed and that's when a lockout happens because they can't come to a new agreement. Typically the negotiations start way earlier than when the CBA is about to run out, right? Because they want to be able to come to an agreement before so they don't have to miss any games. Right now they have not come to an agreement, but they probably will because no one wants to get to seven September and us be watching hockey. That being said, the NHL actually had their own lockout in 2004, which lasted the whole season. That entire season was canceled because they couldn't come up with a collective bargaining agreement. It's called a lockout because the players are locked out of the facilities. They cannot go to work. Not only that, the players cannot talk to owners and they can't talk to any staff of the team. They can't talk to the coach. They can't talk to anyone that's employed by the organization, which is kind of funny. So if you are an employee of the organization and you aren't a player, you're on the team of the owners, regardless of how you feel about what's going on. Players don't get paid during the lockout. They don't make any money. In every player's contract, it says you do not get paid if there is a labor dispute. Up until 1995, the NBA was actually the only major sports league that hadn't had a stoppage of games because of a labor dispute. But in 1995, it happened. 1995's labor dispute was a not super long one. It was about four months. It started at the end of the season in July and then went until September 12. So no games were lost. There was still an 82 game season the following year. So what came out of this lockout? What came after these negotiations? Well, the average player salary went up 1.7 to $3 million. So the salary cap went up. Rookie scale contracts were introduced, which was a win for veteran players and a win for owners. And who got messed over? The rookies. The rookies got messed over because they were forced to sign cheap contracts. Before the rookie scale contracts, Glenn Robinson in 1994 signed a $67 million 10 year deal with the Milwaukee Bucks. I think the veteran players were a little bit salty that these guys who hadn't even stepped on an NBA court were getting paid so much money. And of course, the owners were like, hey, yeah, we'd love to sign rookies to cheap contracts. We're for it. So they settled on that deal. So the rookies got screwed over in that. The second lockout was in 1996. This one only lasted four hours because there was a new $50 million television deal and the dispute was over how they were going to split that money. Obviously, it was resolved very quickly because they didn't want a repeat of what had happened last summer. I think everyone was very exhausted. So they were able to be very lenient on what was a good deal for both sides and they moved on with their lives. In 1998 though, there was a, another lockout. So with this one, it shortened the season to only 50 games. Currently they were under a collective bargaining agreement, but the owners were allowed to reopen it. Why did they reopen it? Well, the NBA was losing money. It wasn't making as much money as it was before and the salary cap remained the same, meaning that the players got all of their money, but the owners were losing money. As a matter of fact, 15 of the 29 teams reported losses that year. After this lockout, after this very short season and a cancellation of the All-Star game, a few things came out of it. One, max contracts. This is when the rule that one player could only make a certain amount of money came out. That was a win for the owners. The biannual exception in the mid-level exception started this year. That's a win for the players. An exception is just an excuse to spend more money on your team, increase your payroll, and let the players get more money. The luxury tax was introduced. This was a win for small market teams because the big teams that made lots of money, they could go over the cap, but they'd have to pay a 
luxury tax, and that luxury tax went to the teams that didn't go over the cap. Those were the small market teams. So the small markets were like, hell yeah, we love luxury tax because we get money. Another thing that came out of this was drug testing for performance enhancing drugs in marijuana. Why the owners wanted that, I don't know. You tell me, leave a comment. I don't know why they would really care. That seems like a great place to sacrifice. Why would you give a shit if someone did drugs? Another negative of this lockout was the NBA season was so short that fans were pissed. And obviously it's not a good look. There are labor disputes everywhere. There are strikes everywhere. They happen all the time and they are good. They're just part of the business. They're part of capitalism. But it wasn't a good look because the fans wanted to watch basketball and to them, it just looked like millionaires fighting over nickels and dimes. The last lockout we had was in 2011. The season was shortened to 66 games. This was another dispute over the fact that the NBA was losing viewership and it was losing money, but the players were paid the same. This is what led to what the NBA has now. It's a 49 to 51 split between the owners and the players. There was a lot of infighting in this lockout, because one thing you have to consider when the CBA is being negotiated, a lot of times the players and a lot of times the owners are on different sides. For instance, a lot of the players felt like the negotiations were happening on behalf of the players that were being paid a lot of money. They didn't think that the negotiation of the deal was really reflective of what the average NBA player was experiencing or what he wanted. Most of them just wanted to start playing basketball and making money again. And on the owner's side, you have James Dolan and Jerry Buss. They were fine paying the players more. Why? Because they own the Lakers and the Knicks who make far more money than let's say the Cavs and Dan Gilbert or Robert Sarver at the time with the Phoenix Suns. They were against paying the players more probably because they weren't making as much money. So within the owners group, they were kind of fighting with themselves and saying, hey, whatever, let's sign this deal. Let's start making money again. You have a guy like Jerry Buss who's probably like, hey, I just want to pay these players a lot of money because I want to win. I'm more passionate about my team versus a guy like Dan Gilbert who says, hey, this is a business and I want to make money. So I believe there might be a lockout coming. I don't know if it's going to happen. Obviously, I don't want it to happen. But one thing I want to see in the new CBA is a games played contingency. And I know this is going to come off across very anti-players and pro-owners, but it's not, trust me. We're seeing a lot of players like Ben Simmons, Kyrie Irving, and especially Kawhi Leonard, I live in LA, I go to a lot of Clippers games, sitting out games. Whether they can play, don't want to play, either way, they're not playing. I believe that contracts should be partially guaranteed. And where would this money go if the owners didn't have to pay these big name players money? It could go to 10-day contract guys, it could go to two-way players, it could go to anyone that could sign and get NBA money that they want, and not just go to a guy who's sitting up in a press box getting paid millions of dollars for games he's not playing. That's what I would like to see, but that's me. Uh, I just want to see more guys that are hungry to play the game because that's really where I think it breaks down is when you see guys that are in it for the money, they're in it for the glory for themselves, and people will lose interest, trust me. I think with lockouts, I think that's what shows up the most is the fact that these guys are very concerned about the money, and a lot of times that's their number one concern, and I don't blame them for that, but we don't want to see that. We want to see guys that want to win and are passionate about the game and being champions. Uh, but, you know, I understand both sides. So, thank you for being here. Much love. Be good to your mothers.